person being interviewed is Kevin Phillips. The interviewer is Rob Lasher. Today's date is 27, February 27, 2017. Subject is DOD military civilians and family members in count Cumberland County and their personal experiences. Kevin, can you talk to me a little bit about your past uh, experiences and what brought you to Cumberland County, Cumberland County and your military history? Um, I was uh, born in Minneapolis, Minnesota, uh, but I'm, I'm was primarily raised in uh, Montana, uh, Helena, Montana. Uh, when I was in high school, I was in uh, I wrestled uh, one year, was in cross country three years, track four years, um, and then I went to the uh, University of uh, Montana where I got my uh, college uh, degree. Um, and then, do you want me to go into my military uh, uh, piece right now, or? You can continue talking about your family life. Okay. Um, uh, I have a. Uh, I was. I was first married in two thousand one uh, on uh, October seventh, or it was October first. I can't remember. It was the day that we started bombing Afghanistan after nine uh, eleven. Um, and I'll talk a little bit about that later on. Uh, the marriage ended, and then um, because I was in. Uh, this area, I met a woman out of Pittsburgh, uh, formerly Gwen Hall, uh, uh, now Gwen Phillips, of course, and uh, we were uh, married on uh, October 20th uh, in 2012. Okay, can we back up just a little bit further? Sure. Because uh, I want people to understand where you're coming from yep. and what actually brought you here to Cumberland County. So let's go back into what brought you into the military. You know what? Um, I I grew up with uh, hearing stories about the military, and I, I developed a love, especially for the uh, army. Uh, and the first person that influenced me was my uh, grandfather, uh, Frederick uh, Woodmancy. We call him Fred, and uh, he was raised in uh, England, uh, a, a part of a family that raised sheep. And there, uh, it's a, a society that. Um, where you're born is where you're going to stay. And uh, so he would have he dropped out of um, grade school, I think at uh, age 14, uh, and it, shortly thereafter he joined the British Territorial Army, which is the equivalent of the uh, America's uh, National Guard, and uh, that was right around World War I, and um, he, uh, he uh, was in uh, England for a year and a half, and then he was in the British trenches for uh, three and a half years. Um, and some of the family stories that we've heard about them is uh, during the World War I, they would house the soldiers with families, unlike America, where there's you can't do that under the U.S. Constitution. And one of the stories was they weren't fed a lot by that family, and the woman uh, the, of the household would say, eat up, uh, boys, there's plenty more in the pantry. And one of the soldiers at one point said, well, Mom, we wish you'd uh, get more out of the uh, pantry. And, of course, uh, that, that didn't uh, happen. Um, so in 1915, he was sent to the uh, trenches. He was uh, infantry, uh, also secondary MOS, military occupation specialty of mule tender, and uh, he would take care of the uh, mules. Um, everybody in his platoon would get killed time and time again, and it got to the point where he refused to make friends because it hurt him so bad that um, it, it, it just tore him up, so he kind of stayed by himself towards the end uh, just because it was so brutal uh, in the trenches. Uh, he said about the mules that they were very smart, and if you were mean to a mule, the mule would get back to you, so he was very careful to take care of the mules, and they took care of him. Hated officers. He did not like officers. Um, because of that, he refused to be promoted to a sergeant. He refused to be promoted to a officer, and his saying that he passed down uh, from uh, family member to family member was never volunteer when you're in the army, never volunteer. Um, so, and one of the other stories was the officers got strawberry jam when they were in the trenches and the enlisted got marmalade. And that they had marmalade on their toast day after day after day and he could never eat marmalade um, jam. It, he just refused to uh, eat it. Uh, he was gassed a few times, and then on the last day, on Armistice Day, uh, which was uh, uh, November 11th, 1918, before they signed the armistice, he was injured by a shell 
that exploded, uh, howitzer shell, and he was in a British hospital for a year. Migrated to America, married my my grandmother, and and that kind of is the rest is history. Except for my mom said that when there were thunderstorms, um, it it brought back terrible flashbacks for him, and he would pace around very nervously in the uh, living room. They lived on a ranch; they were ranchers, and it it you know today we know that's uh, PTSD, uh, but they didn't know that back then. It was shell shock or whatever. Um, so, I mean, the war deeply affected him. He was a good, a good man, but, um, you know, the, the war definitely um, affected him. Um, and then there was my father, Richard Lee Phillips, and he was also, uh, and that, they were, their ranch, my Frederick Woodman C., uh, that ranch was around Highwood, Montana, and my father was also raised around Highwood, Montana, um, and uh, he went to Montana State College where he went through ROTC. And at that time, everybody uh, that was in college would go through ROTC or else you'd be drafted. It's far better to be a, an officer than an enlisted man. So he did that and then he became a, a field artillery officer and uh, he, most of his experiences that he conveyed to me were in Korea. He just stayed in the, the minimum three years and got out. But, um, and again, they're, they're not great stories. They're kind of horrible stories, but for some reason it made me fall in love with the, the army, and it's kind of how he got abused, uh, you know, as, as any of us that have been officers, sometimes you get around bad officers that are higher ranking or just bad situations. Um, and he talked about Korea being bitterly cold. They stayed in these Quonset huts. Uh, they were always on field maneuvers up on the DMZ. Now, this was not during the Korean War. It was after the Korean War. It was in the late 50s. But it still was not a hospitable place. They were always concerned that the uh, North Koreans were going to punch across the line, attack them, uh, etc. One of the stories that he told was um, he was sleeping in the back of a, a deuce and a half, and it was face downhill. And he said he had like this hillbilly driver that didn't set the brakes or something like that, and the uh, gears disengaged, and it started rolling down the hill. Well, he jumped out of the back to save himself, and he got tangled in this camouflage netting. And he would have been drugged to death, but for the fact the truck hit a stone uh, wall as they were uh, going down the hill, I guess in Korea. And I've never been to Korea. I guess there's stone walls all over uh, uh, Korea. Another time they were standing in line saluting on this muddy road. And this full bird colonel was roaring down the road uh, in the back, standing up or whatever. And uh, so everybody was saluting. And... Uh, Jeep goes down the road 50 yards, stops, backs up, and this full bird comes out of the Jeep and comes up to my dad amongst all these soldiers and just starts screaming and yelling at him that he had a terribly sloppy salute. Uh, you know, what kind of officer was he, uh, et cetera, et cetera. Um, just crazy stories like that. Another time, he and a warrant officer, and my dad was would have been a first lieutenant at the time, were sent into this uh, village and um, they were looking for enlisted soldiers um, who weren't supposed to be in that village. And the reason that the enlisted soldiers would go into the village is because they wanted to drink and they wanted to, uh, uh, to shack up with the prostitutes. And so they saw this enlisted soldier and this, this soldier started to run away and the crusty old warrant officer took up the gun and was going to shoot the guy in the back and my dad hit his hand. And uh, the gun went off, but the, the gun had been sh knocked away enough that the guy didn't get shot in the back. And my dad was like, the guy's running, but we're not going to kill him for it. So um, there was another time when uh, my dad was eating in the mess hall, and this, there were rats everywhere. A rat ran across the uh, mess hall. His leg just reflexively jerked out, hit the rat in the head, and killed him. All the other officers, that, junior officers that were with him, were very impressed at... Uh, you know, how that had happened, you know, and, and my dad said he didn't even think about it. His leg just jerked out and he kicked it. So, um, and then they talked about the Slicky Boys there, that theft was a real problem uh, in Korea. And um, he had this company commander that said, I want this cannon gone. It was an old cannon. So they took it out from front of the um, headquarters building. My dad had it dragged to this um, creek and uh, the next morning it was it was gone they had somehow come under the wire and he never did figure out how they got it out of there but they did they were very industrious so anyway just kind of based on those stories i was always very interested in uh, going into the um, army i wanted to uh, it, it sounds like you had a lot of a long heritage of military um with your father and your grandfather yeah and supposedly we had some uh 
some of my kin were also in the Civil War. I've heard stories about drummer boys on both sides that fought. Um, I haven't done the geology or genealogy on that. Um, That's a very nice background that you, you you've summed up for us so far. Yeah. yeah. I, I, now that, would, that you've given me a really nice picture of that, could you also let us know, um, since that led you towards the military, let's talk about some of your military experiences and your life in the military, and we'll follow on with a few questions. Sure. So I was interested in high school and joining the uh, National Guard. I tried to convince my mom uh, that I should uh, join the Montana National Guard between my junior and senior year. Uh, she followed along the lines of her father, Frederick Woodmancy, and it was like, never volunteer. She didn't like the military, did not think that it was a good idea, and she refused to uh, sign as uh, my parent to go early. Um, so I had to wait until I graduated from high school in uh, 1984. Um, I went down to uh, basic training down at uh, Fort Leonard Wood, started in June in 1984. Um, I wouldn't say that I was a natural soldier. Um, I, the drill sergeants put the fear of God in me. Uh, some of the other soldiers, I think, were a little more indifferent to the whole atmosphere. Um, but I did, uh, I did survive it. There were some uh, interesting and f funny experiences for me. I went down with the Montana Buddy Platoon, and so um, we were all Montana kids. Uh, we were at the rifle range one time, and, and they kept egging me the whole time. you got to try chew. you got to try chew. So I tried some chew out at the night range, about passed out. Um, and then uh, we went out on the FTX, uh, this three or four day FTX. And again, we're all from Montana and there's these lights floating around outside and we didn't know what they were. And so we're all running through the woods and the drill sergeants are like, what is going on? What is this? And we're like, what are these things flying around? They, they're like, what? You've never seen lightning bugs before? And they, they were just incredulous that, you know, who are these hicks from Montana that have never seen lightning bugs? But we don't have lightning bugs in Montana. So, um, so anyway, uh, I survived that. I, uh, I graduated in uh, July, I think, and then I had to start AIT almost immediately. But before I started, I had a few hours. I remember going down to the PX at uh, Fort Leonard Wood, and at that time they had the younger drinking age. So I bought a bag of M&Ms and I, I had some beer. And I was in the PX eating my M&Ms and drinking beer, and this woman with this German accent was like, what in the world? Who would drink beer and eat M&Ms? And I remember the other woman saying, well, if you just went through basic training, maybe you'd be doing that too. So uh, uh, anyway, so that from that, then I rolled into my combat engineering uh, advanced individual training, also located at Fort Leonard Wood, uh, out in the sticks. We were in these old World War II barracks. Almost immediately, the hot water um, heater broke. And uh, it was so far out in the field that um, we didn't work close to a chow hall. So they would bring these mermite cans out every morning for our food. And uh, the eggs would be green. So we had green scrambled eggs the whole time we were there. It was years and years and years after that when I could eat scrambled eggs. They just, uh, it, I couldn't even stand the thought of uh, eating them. So as a combat engineer, uh, we trained on uh, blowing up bridges, building bridges, playing with explosives. Uh, installing landmines, uh, et cetera. Uh, very uh, hands-on. Um, I had wanted originally to be an um, uh, x-ray technician, but my uh, mother was concerned that that would run long and I wouldn't start college in the fall, and then I'd never go to college, and I wouldn't amount to anything. So I, I didn't do that, and I went to the combat engineering, which was a lot shorter, which is very hands-on, which I'm all thumbs, uh, so it was a miracle that uh, I got through that, but uh, I got through it. Um, and, uh, and and I remember being there at night, and we'd have to go do CQ duty, man, the desk or whatever. And it, it was out in the sticks, and we'd walk to the building, and we'd walk by this family of skunks that seemed like every night that we did it. So anyway, that was that was kind of weird. So... And then uh, the next summer, I was back with my unit, the 1063rd uh, Combat en Engineers, part of the Montana National Guard, 163rd Armored Regiment. And we were down at Gowan Field, which is in uh, Boise, Idaho. And um, I just remember in the morning, I'd wake up and I'd have this cot, and I'd have it beside my uh, tank, or beside was an armored personnel carrier. Um, and uh, 
I would feel the ground rumbling because we were with this tank regiment. And uh, I was always paranoid that I was going to get run over by a um, tank, so I always put my cot as close as possible to the APC mm. so I didn't worry about uh, getting run over. And then at night, after we did our work, you know, clearing mines, breaching the minefields for the tanks or whatever, then at night they would shut things down again. And uh, being the, the guard at that time, they would have this Jeep, and then they had the trailer in the back, and it was filled full of ice, and then you could go and buy a beer. And, uh, and then I remember um, I came back from having uh, Chow, went back to my foxhole, and my the E4 that I was in the foxhole with, he was uh, smoking a joint, which, uh, <laughs> which was uh, kind of interesting. But uh, I was a private at the time, so I wasn't expected to rat him out. I wasn't in a leadership position, so I just kept my mouth shut, and all was well. So uh, that was uh, my experience uh, that that one summer as a uh, National Guardsman. Then in 1986, uh, I was in the Sigma Nu fraternity house, and the guy by the name of uh, Kevin Pat Enright um, wanted to go to airborne school, and he wanted somebody to go with him. So I had to go take this special ROTC class, train up, do all that kind of stuff. And then uh, we went to airborne school, but as irony would have it, um, he went two cycles ahead of me, so I didn't even go through with him. Um, I was in Apocalypse Company uh, that summer, um, and I was not a natural jumper. Um, scared to death I was going to die each time I uh, jumped, but uh, I figured it was... It was uh, worse being scared than uh, dying, so I um, jumped all uh, five times. And um, there was one time, uh, and we used to have, there would be Air Force Reserve pilots that would fly us, and they needed to get some training while they were having us jump, so they would do Napa Earth, where they would fly low, and then they would go all over the, um, all over the Earth. And so it made it a little jerky, um, and then they would pop up or do whatever, get to the right height to jump. Well, I had already jumped, and this is probably the third jump that we did. And um, somebody got sick after I got jumped. They threw up, and then it just started this chain reaction. Everybody in the whole flipping plane threw up. And uh, so we, we get back to the barracks, and the um, company commander, the cadre company commander gets up in front of us, and he says, you know what, guys? He's like, you need to eat peanut butter and jelly sandwiches before you jump. You know why? Because he says peanut butter and jelly sandwiches taste just as good coming up as they do going down. So I always remembered that. That was, uh, that was kind of crazy. It sounds like sage advice. <laughs> so, and then I was primarily with ROTC cadets. And I remember the cadre first sergeant loved us because there were like two weekends um, during our class. And it was the first time that he'd been there as a cadre that he wasn't called out to go down to the jail to bail somebody out either the Friday night or the Saturday night. So, and that makes sense. I mean, ROTC cadets, we weren't going to be too horribly uh, wild. And the guy next to me on the stick, he broke his toe on the second jump. And um, and he talked to the medic, and the medic said, you know, you, you can go home, heal up, and come back and finish your jumps, or you can just gut it out. The, the guy, he was like, I am not coming back here. And he gutted it out. And every time he landed, I would hear him scream, when uh, that toe hit the ground, but you know what? He did it. He got in all of his jumps and got his jump wings. So anyway, kind of wrote down some of this stuff. Let's see if I'm getting everything here. Um, and then in the summer of 1987, I did ROTC advance camp, and I did that at uh, Fort Lewis, uh, Washington. And uh, I really enjoyed my ROTC class at the University of Montana. In fact, I still stay in touch with a lot of those guys through Facebook. Uh, but I can't say that I really enjoyed uh, the advance camp. Uh, I thought it was kind of a cheerleader camp. Uh, I thought it was the person that got up in front of everybody and kind of beat their chest. And, you know, if you were the extrovert's extrovert, you'd get the high score or whatever. So, and I knew that I was going to be going guaranteed reserve. I knew I wanted to go to law school. So... I, it wasn't incumbent on me as much to play the game, uh, but I, I kind of, I can honestly say that I didn't enjoy uh, the advance camp uh, as much. So, and then I got my commission in uh, 1988, and I was, uh, I, I put intelligence officer at the top of my list. But if you're a reserve officer, and that was the sexy thing to be way back in the day was intel. Everybody wanted to be intelligence. 
But with the uh, reserve, since everybody wanted to be an intelligence officer, they said you had to find a slot uh, in, to go into in order to be an intel officer. So um, anyway, I could. Um, my buddy filled the one intel p position in the state of Montana, so I couldn't uh, fill that. So they made me a quartermaster officer, best thing that ever happened to me. Went to my quartermaster officer basic course in 1989. I said, look, three strikes, I'm out if I don't like this. I absolutely love the course. Thought it was great. I liked the people there, liked the atmosphere. And um, I, on weekends, I would go around and explore the Civil War battlefields. Uh, I, I would uh, go to the uh, plantations or whatever, and I enjoyed the course of instruction at well, as well at Fort Lee. So um, that, that was great. I sponsored an officer from Yemen, took him around a little bit to include Virginia Beach. I thought his eyes were going to pop out of his head when we went down on the beach area, he saw the women in uh, bikinis and stuff. <laughs> um, he, he, was, uh, he was pretty nice. Uh, Mohammed Al-Shabibi, he was a, a nice guy. We did an FTX up at uh, Fort Hill. The student officer that was in charge got us lost. We were wandering through these roads with dust. We're in the back of these trucks. Finally, we got to where we were going. We came out, and we were just covered in dust. There, I've never seen so many angry officers in my life. And then at one point, I got put in charge of um, a, a platoon or whatever, and I had these two Jordanian officers that were under me, and they were ticking me off for some reason. So later on, they came up to me, and they said, we need to pray to the east. Which way is the east? And I was, I was still ticked at them. I said, that way, and I did a kind of a guess. I mean, I wasn't... I didn't know, but I thought it was that way. Well, later on, I, I learned that I had him praying to the Northwest. So anyway, what the heck, you know? I guess it worked out in the end. So uh, anyway, and then in, uh, I'm going to skip ahead to 1999. I was one of two officers, reserve officers, to be selected for the Logistics Executive Development course. That's the capstone course for logistics officers at uh, Fort Lee. Um, and uh, I sponsored a Australian officer, although I said that he should have sponsored me, Tony Clough, uh, C-L-O-U-G-H. Um, he was very outgoing, hard drinker, et cetera, et cetera, and he was with some other ANZAC officers, and I did s some stuff with them, and they were a lot of fun. Um, I enjoyed it greatly. And then we did a battle staff ride up to uh, Gettysburg, and that was very interesting. Uh, you know, you get... You can't get that type of uh, training anywhere else. So, and then in 2001, I was with a water supply company, or uh, actually battalion, and uh, I went, was part of Bright Star, and this was right after 9-11, uh, uh, right after I got married the first time, and then I went over to Egypt, uh, which was kind of a bad feeling because it was an exercise. They didn't cancel the exercise. They didn't give anybody any ammo over there, at least on the Army side. And so you felt really defenseless. You didn't know what was going on or whatever. Um, and we were with the uh, Marines, and the Marines actually issued their uh, Marines uh, ammo, and they would post these guys on top of connexes. The Marines didn't have any equipment stolen. The Army, they had their connexes raided left and right because there was no ammo, and so people could go in there and pilfer it or whatever. So anyway, but I was, I was there, um, so I... I got, uh, I did the, uh, the Bright Star experience. And then through the uh, Montana Reserve Officer Association, with the war kicking off, um, I started to realize that all these soldiers were getting mobilized. And the problem was, when you get your guard and reservists that are mobilized, um, it impacts their professional licenses. And I'm talking about either, you know, like beauticians, doctors real estate agents or whatever, um, they go and then they can't do their their legal education or whatever, and then they come back and find that th their, their ticket's been punched, they've lost their license or whatever. So I actually drafted a bill and the Montana Reserve Officer Association uh, sponsored it, and, um, and then we wrapped in a couple other uh, measures as well, such as recruiters were being denied access to high schools and um, which we said was not right, and they should be treated the same as uh, college uh, recruiters. And then also people were leaving the state, they were deploying, and then they were told they couldn't vote in Montana elections. So wrapped that into a bill, and it actually passed overwhelmingly. So I was uh, very pleased uh, with that. I suppose with the fervor of the war, uh, you know, people wanted to be patriotic or whatever. And it was the right thing to do, quite honestly. If somebody goes and serves their country, they sh should not lose their uh, professional license. 
So um, that was good, and that was in the uh, 2003 uh, legislature. In 2004, I deployed to uh, Afghanistan. I was a reservist. I was a major at the time. Uh, I, I was part. I was part of the Army Reserve Slice with uh, Defense Energy Support Center, which was part of Defense Logistics Agency. And I was assigned to uh, Defense Energy Support Center Middle East, which was based out of uh, Manama, Bahrain. And uh, I went there. My order said I was going there, got there, and my boss said, oh, no, you're not staying here. And Bahrain was actually pretty nice. There was beer there. The quarters were okay. There was a house that was just for reservists and all that stuff. He said, you're going to Afghanistan. You're the liaison. So um, I went to uh, Bagram. I was the, I got there in April of uh, 2004, and that's when the um, tw that's when the 10th Mountain Division was just starting to uh, rotate out, and uh, the 25th uh, ID was coming in from uh, Hawaii. So my role was to inform the headquarters in the Middle East what was going on with all the fuel. We had fuel in. Uh, Bagram, and we also had fuel down in Kandahar, and then we also had fuel up in Karshikhanabad, Uzbekistan, K2. So um, I primarily was based out of Bagram, but then I would fly down to uh, uh, Kandahar and ch check on that situation, fly on a C-130 or whatever, and then I would check up at Karshikhanabad as well. Um, the situation got tenuous because um, we weren't getting the fuel. How are we doing on time? We doing okay? Don't worry about time. Um, uh, the, the fuel got tenuous, uh, and we, f we figured what was happening was um, DESC would contract with the Pakistani refineries, and then what the Pakistani refineries would do is they would subcontract with uh, trucking firms, jingle trucks, and then the jingle trucks would bring the fuel across. <coughs> but it was dangerous work. The jingle truck drivers were not highly paid or whatever, and so... Um, th there would be these slowdowns where all of a sudden the fuel wouldn't be coming across the border or whatever. And um, I, I was getting pounded as the liaison officer uh, at uh, when I was in Bagram by the Joint Logistics Commander saying, hey, you know, what's going on? You're not doing your job, except it was getting pretty nasty. Um, and so at a certain point I talked, and he got so mad, he was like, you're not coming to my meetings anymore. So, and I feared I, he was going to shut me out of the building and I wouldn't have access to the computers and all that stuff. And I talked to my boss down at uh, uh, Bahrain and he's like, well, make, don't make it look like you're fleeing. Just stay a couple days and then just ease your way out. Well, shoot, when that happened, I was down at the airport with 10 minutes later. I, I wasn't going to ease out anything. I was getting away from there. So I, I went up to Karshikhanabad and they were working on a fuel farm up there. They were trying to pay for it for... Uh, the Uzbek uh, military. <coughs> so I finished out my uh, tour up there. But, and let me back up a little bit. Bagram was interesting um, in that, uh, so the jingle trucks would bring the fuel in from Pakistan and they'd bring them into um, uh, to Bagram or Kandahar, to, depending on, you know, the road had split or whatever. Um, but they'd want to make a little extra money. And we'd have um, seals on them, but they would figure out how to jigger the, uh, the, where the fuel was coming out, and so then they would siphon. Well, if you siphon out fuel, <coughs> um, it's going to show when you pump the fuel out. So how, what did they do when they, they siphoned out 10% of the fuel? They'd add 10% water. So we'd get the fuel at uh, Bagram, and uh, they would have to run it through a kind of a filter separator deal to get out all the water. Now, ordinarily, the Air Force would say, no way in hell are we going to use this fuel because they're very, very fussy and for a good reason. Because if you got water in your fuel and you're in an airplane way up in the sky, it freezes. And what happens when your fuel line freezes? That airplane drops out of the sky like a rock. But fuel was such a precious commodity at Bagram that um, they, they couldn't be so fussy. And so they would have to, you know, put in fizzy and all this other stuff to take out the water, and the Air, the Air Force actually uh, would use that fuel. But, I, but there was kind of an embargo, too, at Bagram at that time that um, if you were flying in, you had to have enough fuel to fly out, too, because planes sucked up so much fuel that they didn't want them to routinely uh, fill up there. <coughs> but anyway, it was interesting. And then um, one time we got hit by mortars, and we had two 50K uh, 
bags, and uh, they got blown up. Uh, but the fuel, miraculously, we didn't lose much fuel. We had the environmental liners in and stuff, and they just sucked it back up. <coughs> Excuse me. Are you okay? <coughs> yeah. Uh-huh. Take a second. It's okay. Yeah. So, um, anyway. They put... They that's, that's okay. Did you have another thought you want to continue on with, Kevin? <coughs> uh, yeah. Yeah. Well, I, if you have a question, Kenny, and I'm sorry, I'm That's rambling. okay. I, I, this is your story. I, I, I'd like to advance, though, a okay. little bit, if you don't mind, to sure. where, um, what brought you to this region, to, to Cumberland County, or the Cumberland County area, and then what brought you to Cumberland County? Sure. Uh, what brought me here was, um, I had just come back from, and if we have more time, I'll circle back uh, to cover in some of that, but I, I'd come back from uh, down at Guantanamo Bay, Cuba, Come back to my civilian job, was not happy there, wanted to do something else, and I'd become a recent JAG officer. And so uh, an opportunity came up to be a JAG officer at Letterkenny Army Depot, which is just outside of Cumberland County. And so I did an active tu duty tour there, and, uh, it, and it, it turned out to be a wonderful experience. I, I like the area. I like rural areas. <coughs> and um, I got contract uh, attorney experience fiscal law experience, admin law experience to include investigations, 15-6 uh, investigations, um, areas that I hadn't really had before. And because I got that experience out at Letterkenny Army Depot, then it made me more attractive to become a, a civilian uh, attorney uh, for the federal government, specifically for a Department of Defense or one of the uh, sub-agencies. So um, it, was, it, it was just a wonderful, wonderful experience for me. That's great. So you, you worked as an attorney at Letterkenny. Yep. And you transitioned as a Department of Army civilian? Yes, I did. Um, I came off <coughs> tour in uh, 2010. In May of 2010, I came off tour. And I, uh, I, I was offered at Letterkenny Army Depot a GS-11 um, term position, which would have meant year to year. Or I could go to Corpus Christi Army Depot as a uh, GS-13. Uh, permanent position. Well, shoot, that's there's not much uh, thought with that. So, went down to Corpus Christi. I was uh, I had uh, Gwen as a girlfriend at the time, and she wasn't too horribly happy with uh, me be, being down at Corpus Christi. So, when the position opened up back at uh, Letterkenny Army Depot, one of my coworkers, Melinda Nar, was not happy that I had gone down there. She wanted me back at uh, Letterkenny Army Depot, so she lobbied and um, they. They opened a third position so I could come back up to uh, Letterkenny Army Depot. And so I did that. So that, that was good. Wow. So what brought you to Cumberland County? The reason that I came to uh, Cumberland County was I just got off a um, six-month uh, active duty tour at my reserve unit down at Richmond. And a position opened up at uh, DLA Distribution, which is in uh, New Cumberland. And I applied for it. It's a lateral transfer and uh, because of my experience uh, <clears throat> with uh, down at Letterkenny Army Depot, um, they, they picked me up. So, yeah. And I moved to uh, Enola. Um, and, the, and the reason that I, I looked at going to uh, DLA New Cumberland is my uh, wife has a job at Hershey Medical Center, and she was tired of that 71-mile drive each way. She did that for about two years, and she was getting really burned out of it. So it was like a godsend when the position opened up at uh, DLA. So it's good. And DLA distribution, it's its the FedEx for all of the uh, military. Um, if you need something shipped all over the world, there is there are 24 distribution centers all over the world, and then there's one expeditionary uh, distribution center. And uh, so they ship stuff everywhere. To, and there's actually one depot at um, our distribution center where I work. I, I work for a one-star commander, but then the the, uh, the full bird colonel, uh, one step below, he, he does the distribution center at, uh, at DLA Susquehanna. That's what they call it. Okay. So it, if my memory serves me correctly, the DLA is actually on the other side of the river. So that would be in uh, Dolphin County. Correct. Actually, no, actually, um, no, it's, uh, it's, it's this side of the river. Um, it's just, just south across the river from uh, Harrisburg. Yeah, it's right next to... Uh, Your piece is? 
Yeah. Okay. Mm -hmm. Yep. It's right across 581, kind of across 581 from um, the the Naval Supply Activity. Actually, it's it's down the road a little bit, but it's somewhat close to it. So, so. you you work in in Cumberland County, and you live in Cumberland County. Yes, I do. Oh, good. Yeah. So, what are your experiences of Cumberland County? I like Cumberland County. It's a nice uh, it's a nice area. Um, I mean, I would come up here when I was down at Letterkenny quite a bit because I love the. Uh, the Army Heritage Education Center, they get great lectures up there. Uh, you know, if I suppose because they have all the colonels come in for the Army War College or, or whatever, and so I would come up and hear that. I like their the AHEX uh, historical stuff that they've got outside their tanks and all of that, uh, all of that good stuff. So um, it's just it's a very nice uh, community, very pastoral, I guess. So, well. It what makes it so nice for that? I mean, you just came out of the military. Yes. Okay. And then you transferred as a Department of Defense uh, Army civilian. Yeah. And now um, you left Franklin County, yep. came to Cumberland County. So what makes Cumberland County so nice for you? You know what? I like a rural environment, but um, I would say Franklin County is a little more rural than uh, this area. I actually like all the amenities that are uh, in this area. You got uh, it's just a little more compact. You got a lot a lot of stuff within a short amount of uh, distance. For example, you can go to Hershey. Hershey's got the, uh, the I think it's the Giant Center or whatever, and they have concerts there. And I've mentioned the AHEC here that gets world class lectures. Um, you know, you got a ski slope within a, a short distance. Um, you know, you got Wegmans, which is famous as a grocery store, uh, very expensive, but has has high end stuff. Uh, you know, my wife loves Macy's. They got all kinds of Macy's around here. Um, so it's just a little more upscale than uh, Franklin County. Not to knock Franklin County, it has its own strengths, but um, this is just a little different. We live across the road from Owls of Hampton, which is this uh, great pizza place and they've got all these uh, beers on tap etc um, you know you're not going to find that down at uh, uh, Franklin County as a retiree for from the army how has the community treated you uh, you know this is a very uh, military centric area just because you have naval supply um, you've got DLA uh, distribution, and you've got the Army War College here. Well, and you got Fort Indian Town Gap too. So, I mean, it's very hospitable. There's, I mean, you look at the cars around here. Although they don't use those DOD stickers anymore, you still see a lot of cars around with the DOD stickers or whatever. I mean, it's it's very comfortable with the military environment. You're not you're not talking a uh, Portland or you know someplace like that. Portland, Oregon, where it's very, very liberal, and they're they're not as much into the military. This is a very military centric uh, part of the country. So, I mean, it's it's like the deep south in a way, as as far as the military goes. What do you mean? Uh, just very pro military, um, and and you can argue. I've heard it described that this area is like the Bible Belt, and the Bible Belt, of course, is in the in the south. Uh, you know, anywhere between Philadelphia and uh, Pittsburgh has been described as the Bible Belt. It's very conservative, very Republican, God-fearing, mom, apple pie, all of that kind of stuff. So uh, it's, a, it's pretty conservative in this area. So you don't see many Democrats around here. <laughs> I, I can't say that's true or not true, but what has been your favorite experience uh, from Cumberland County? Probably my favorite experience uh, is uh, coming up here. We came up here one time, uh, I think Gwen and I did, and there was actually a um, history uh, event at the Army Heritage Center and uh, Educational Center, and we walked around, and they had these people dressed in period clothes, uh, you know, like World War II, World War I, Civil War, all that kind of stuff. Now, if you talk to Gwen, she's going to tell you something different because she's not into the history. Um, she's she's probably going to tell you something a little different, like shopping or something along those lines. But I, I greatly enjoyed that. I thought that was great. And the lectures, I, I love the lectures here, too. They're top-notch. Okay. Uh, it, and when you, when you look to move to Cumberland County, what was the things that attracted you to coming here? Well, we wanted to be close to where I worked. We wanted to be close to where Gwen worked. Gwen was very fussy on what she wanted for a place to live. Um, she wanted to, it had to be a fairly nice community. Um, she wanted a two-car garage, which 
surprisingly turned out to be very difficult. Um, so we just found this area in Enola, really close to a brand new giant grocery store, close to I-81 for her to hop the highway to get to work, et cetera. Um, so it, it just worked out. So. With your new career at, at Defense Logistics Agency, um, how does that impact Cumberland County, I mean, as far as your job goes. I know it, it does, you don't actually work on community stuff primarily, but I'm, I'm saying yours is more Army stuff. But how, how do you impact Cumberland County? Well, I mean, I, I work on, uh, I was hired to do the uh, labor law and uh, the employment law and versus down at Letterkenny Army Depot. I was kind of like a utility player. I did everything. Um, so I'm dealing with your federal employee uh, unions. I'm dealing with you know people that there's misconduct issues or whatever. So um, it's so if somebody misbehaves uh, at the uh, depot, I would be involved with possibly disciplining or that person getting fired. So um, very narrow niche. Um, where versus the person that works in the you know the distribution center, they're they're the ones getting those packages. And then they're shipping them out to the warfighter and the, the um, sandbox or whatever. Um, I suppose you could argue, I mean, I'm, I'm supporting that effort. So, um, yeah, I don't know if I'm answering your question. but You're doing fine. <coughs> Is there anything else you'd like to add? Yeah, I want to add in real quick. Um, I got up through uh, 2004, and this won't take long, I swear. This would be like three years, and it would go like that. Okay. Um, so anyway, so I... I talked about um, I was in Afghanistan I uh, then I returned home uh, and unfortunately my wife was not waiting for me when I got home I wasn't when I got off the plane she wasn't there we ended up getting divorced and as part of that um, we had a custody evaluator and she flat out told me that if you're in the military you cannot be a good parent uh, that I would have to resign as an officer uh, get out of the military all of that uh, which I did not do. Um, I ended up losing the custody matter. Um, so I, w I was a little bitter over that. Um, and, it, it, you know, through time I've, I've gotten over that. But it fired me up to get something passed again in the Montana legislature. And it was a bill. And this was an issue that was across the country. It wasn't just me. There were a lot of soldiers that um, had issues with this. Uh, in that you can't have your military service used against you uh, in custody matters. So in that, I was not around uh, when that bill was passed. I was at Letterkenny Army Depot, but my, but I, I drafted the bill. It, it went up, and surprisingly, the uh, Montana National Guard picked it up. I didn't think they would, but they, they became interested in it, and they pushed it. And uh, my mom actually went up and testified in behalf of that bill. It got watered down a little bit, but um, you know what? We did something, so um, anyway. And then in 2006, I went to the JAG Officer Basic course as a major. Uh, we had this E7 that thought she was a drill sergeant. Every night, I would come home and my body would just hurt because I was 41 years old at the time. I was the only major in the class. Uh, it, it was it was hard. Um, and then after that, I came back and I needed to get out of there after my uh, divorce. The divorce happened in July of 2006, so I volunteered and I went down to Guantanamo Bay. Uh, I first started out in legal assistance, which was good, uh, you know, helped soldiers that were going through divorce, sailors, etc. I worked in this particle board hut by the sea. It was pretty cool. Didn't have any windows or anything, but it was, it was just close to the sea. That was, that was pretty neat. Uh, I, my boss, uh, uh, Captain, Navy Captain, so 06, uh, Pat McCarthy assigned me to work migrant operations. The JAG officer before that was not very excited about it, didn't really do that great of a job. I loved it. I never, you know, coming from Montana, knew nothing about migrant operations. They were, they were deathly afraid at that, in 2006, late 2006, they were afraid that Fidel Castro was going to die and that was going to cause this mass exodus of Cubans heading for Florida because there's the, the, the dry foot, wet foot policy, which again, I'd never heard of being from Montana, but if the Cubans hit soil in Florida, then they were automatically, in a year, they'd automatically get U.S. citizenship. So the plan was, you, you snap these people or you grab these people out of the sea and you divert them to Guantanamo Bay and then they're not considered on U.S. soil and then you 
repatriate them back to uh, Cuba. So that was interesting. I loved it. I went to, actually went to a law school in uh, Florida, studied up on it because we didn't have any books on migrant operations. I worked with Coast Guard officer Jags. Um, it was really cool. And then the um, the for a while we didn't have a uh, Jag officer to do detention operations with the the guys in the cells. And so I did that towards the end of my time there uh, to include. Um, I was involved with the only Canadian that was uh, down at Guantanamo Bay. He, he was there, and his parents sent a um, Canadian attorney down from Edmonton, uh, Calgary. And uh, this guy refused to meet with his lawyers, which were American lawyers. And so I went and talked to him, and you talked to him through the door, and he said... Um, no, I will only talk to my Canadian lawyer. And so I said, your Canadian lawyers are here. They, Your parents sent them down. And so for the first time ever, he agreed to meet with lawyers, and eventually they negotiated his release back to uh, Canada. So that was my little little tiny piece of uh, history. So, um, And that's, that's basically it. So thanks for indulging me and letting me finish my... my Not little, a problem. This is your story. My little piece. So... <laughs> Is there anything else you'd like to talk about with Cumberland County? Anything that um, that we might have missed that uh, jarred your memory or are things you might like to discuss? You know, I'm still, I've been around Cumberland County, but we just moved up here. We moved up to Cumberland County in uh, November of uh, 2016. Uh, and as I mentioned, we're in Enola. It seems like a fast growing uh, county. Um, I like it. Um, it, it it's it seems like a good place to live. It'd be a good place to uh, raise a family. So, um, and I didn't mention my daughter actually lives down in uh, Plano, Texas, with her mom. In fact, I'm flying down Friday to get her for uh, spring break. So she's in eighth grade down there. So, oh, very good. Yeah. Well, Kevin, I thank you for your time. Yeah. I really appreciate you coming in for this interview. Yeah. And uh, appreciate you sharing your experiences with us in Cumberland County and your life experiences. Well, I appreciate being here. It's wonderful. This is a wonderful program that you're doing. Thank you. Yeah.